Good morning. This is week nine, day one, 2024. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you have cleared the way for us to be saved on account of Christ. You have fulfilled the requirements of the law through your perfect obedience and have purchased for us a great salvation in which we are saved to the uttermost. Help us to respond rightly to your word this day, to store it up, reflect on it, and live it out. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9 begins by unpacking a bit more what Christ has accomplished when it comes to comparing his work to that of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the sacrifices contained therein. We have this notion of the fact that just as the Old Testament had so much shedding of blood, but it wasn't a sacrifice that could purify somebody in the sense of placing them under God's grace and making them acceptable in his sight for eternal life. All of these sacrifices demonstrated that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It pointed forward of the need for purification, of the need to be made right with God, and yet it was not enough to cleanse the conscience. It was not something that would allow someone in the midst of the old covenant to think that somehow they could be saved through the work of Christ and inherit all of the benefits that we see unpacked in the New Testament. There is a shadow of things to come. And people in the Old Testament are saved on account of the faith that they have through the means God provides under the Old Covenant in anticipation of the coming of Christ. It is not as if they are somehow saved differently than us, but if they are trusting in God's provision as he gives it to them under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, they are looking forward to Christ, just as we ourselves look back to Christ. It's not as if there is more than one method of salvation that God uses at different times in history. There is only one, and that is through Christ. The concept of the place in which sacrifices are offered on earth under the Old Covenant is patterned after some kind of a heavenly reality. Now, I don't know precisely what that is that's supposed to mean for us, save to understand that as the high priest goes into an earthly temple once a year, Christ is greater because he does not just represent us as humanity on earth, as the fully man portion of Jesus. He also goes into the heavenly places, fully God, into the heavenly courts, the, the heavenly throne room, the heavenly temple, whatever exactly that looks like. And it's there that Christ goes to offer himself on our behalf, to intercede as our high priest on our behalf. And so, again, we have this comparison of how much greater our Lord is as our priest, as a new Moses, as greater than the angels, as the new covenant exceeds the old covenant. He goes up there into this place into the very presence of God, 
in the spiritual realm, in the unseen realm, on our behalf. And again, this emphasis on a concept of once for all, that there is no repeated sacrifice of Jesus. If Jesus was like the earthly high priests, would have to go in every single year repeatedly to shed blood, then Jesus would have to be suffering repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But, verse 26, as it is, he has appeared once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There is no need for any other sacrifice. There will never be any other sacrifice by which man might be saved. And then the author of Hebrews brings us to another point of reflection, verse 27 and 28. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. No sense of uh, second chance, uh, no sense of a holding pattern or a holding place. The idea is that you will die and then face judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, and we would read many as any who would come to believe in him, he will appear a second time. But that second coming will serve a different purpose. He will not come as another sacrifice. He will not come to deal with sin, as the author says here. He's already dealt with that. That work is finished as Jesus cries out on the cross, as the Father confirms by raising him from the dead. But the second coming, the return, will be to save those who are eagerly waiting for him to bring to himself the people that he has gone on ahead to prepare a place for, John chapter 14. And so all throughout this letter, and you see this throughout all of the New Testament letters, if you, you kind of read with some attention, concepts of theology, the study of the thinking of God, concepts of his character, concepts of his work, the offices that Christ holds, the titles that he has. All of these things can be explained and unpacked and reflected on at a theoretical, perhaps, level. I don't know if that's the right word. But all of this theology, all of this thinking matters at a very practical level. These concepts, these thoughts, these explanations of who God is and what he has done matter immensely to us in our daily lives because it implies how we should respond, how we should live, how we should react in light of what we know to be true. And even here, you have this lengthy chapter on the, the sacrifice of Christ as compared with the Old Testament sacrifices. But you have this closing note that he will come to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And so a simple application, a simple reflection on a text like this is to ask yourself, am I one of those people? Am I eagerly waiting for Christ's return? And if I'm not, why not? What is happening in my life? What am I dealing with right now? You know, where is my focus that has caused me to not feel, to not think, as if I am among those who are eagerly waiting for him? And then pray and ask God to help confirm this in your heart and to let this be something that he works on in you. Let us pray. 
our gracious Master and our God. Assist us to proclaim the glories of our God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Help us to, like the disciples, look forward with eager expectation of your return to live each day as if you are returning tomorrow. It is hard for us to do day in and day out. It is hard for us not to grow weary or to get distracted or overcome by the things of this world. And so we ask for your help that we might seek communion with you first and foremost. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.